Hi guys, welcome to uh, video number three. This is 2.3 in our discussion on the economic um, growth of the United States in the early late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, today's discussion is on a movement known as the Progressive Era. And the Progressive Era is kind of, for everything that the Gilded Age was of being this, you know, kind of hollow shell of looking so beautiful on the outside but being really rotten on the inside, for everything that that was, the Progressive Era really is this attempt um, by Americans to clean up society, to reform it, to make it actually the gil actually as golden as the Gilded Age hoped it would be. And so today, as we go through this, I want you to think about um, think about our discussion on the Gilded Age and and the robber barons and industrialization and how how at times it was really sh people really struggled, and then consider that with what we see in this video where we talk about how people really are trying to take hold of society and change it for the better. So when we're looking for kind of a good definition of the, the progressive era, um, the, really the best way to think of it is, is that it's an era of widespread social and political reform that happened in the United States uh, from the 1890s all the way up to the 1920s. Um, the goal often was to eliminate many social problems caused by industrialization, immigration, urbanization, um, and, and some of the corruption of government. So the idea is that they're going to clean up those tenement houses. They're going to start to provide more money and more resources for people. They're going to start to provide health care. They're going to um, try to get rid of a lot of the social problems that had existed previously and really try to clean society up for, uh, for good once and for all. It's a very idealistic way of looking at things. Uh, most of these people thought that they were doing genuine good. And in the cases of things like prohibition, um, while their heart might have been the right place, the outcome was far different than I think many of the people had wanted at that time. We're going to talk about a number of different people in the progressive era, um, but one of them, and maybe the, one of the most important people, is somebody by the name of Jane Addams. Um, Jane Addams was a, was a person who really, uh, because of her, her status in society, had the ability to kind of reach out and help other people. And so she creates what is known as Hull House, um, which are these settlement houses. And the idea is you come, you can move out of the slums and these tenement houses, move into these places where you can get education, where you'll have child care, where um, you'll maybe have uh, 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 meals, free meals each night. And the idea is you go off and work all day long and then you come back and then other parts of life are taken care of for you until it's time for you to move on, until you've pulled yourself up to the point where you can then move on and move out of these houses. Um, for a lot of people, like Jane Addams, she had become really disillusioned with what America had become. Um, she looked around and saw things like monopolies and saw them as corrupting society. And so she really wants to try to clean things up. Another person is a photographer by the name of Jacob Reese. Um, Reese lives in, in uh, is a photographer and lives in many of these major cities at the time. And looking around, he sees a lot of struggle. He sees people who are um, living a lifestyle that <clears throat> is very different than the wealthy of the community. And his goal is really to bring light and bring information to those downtrodden individuals. And so one of the things that he does is he takes his foot, his camera and he goes around to these different tenement houses, these different slums, and takes pictures of them. And he collects these pictures into a presentation. And he shows this, these slideshows, these presentations, with, with his own narration, uh, to the, the, the wealthy of society. And he calls it How the Other Half Lives. And it's such a successful um, lecture tour that he actually even writes a book about his experiences and, and couples that with his pictures. And the book becomes a bestseller. And it might, and it's easily to say that there might not have been the same vivor and, and, and desire to change society in the progressive movement if it hadn't have been for somebody like Jacob Rees. Because what Rees really does is he shines a light on those who have no voice. If you remember, the Gilded Age, as long as you had money, you really had a voice. You had that ability to kind of leverage what you wanted and, and get done what you wanted. But it's when you don't have a voice because you don't have money that then the Gilded Age, the, the rotten of the Gilded Age really shows through. And so what Reese is trying to do is he's trying to give help to those who are voiceless, in a sense. And so this picture and the, and that you're seeing here is actually a photo, a photograph that Reese took. Um, and you can see in just this one photo, there is roughly five to six people living in this small, uh, this small room um, with poor lighting, poor ventilation, probably no indoor sewer system. So you're having to use the restroom outside somewhere. And so it's, it makes for um, a very tough living conditions. And that's what Reese wants to show. And within a matter of months, cities began to, the cleanup process because they look around, they see these things and they say, we've got to change. 
Now, there is one other group that really shines at this time in the Progressive Era, and those are people are known as muckrakers. Muckrakers were, were um, journalists, often powerful journalists, well-known journalists, who used their influence, used their power to expose the offals of society. Um, the term actually was given to them by uh, Teddy Roosevelt when he, became, when he was in Congress and later on when he was President of the United States. He would say that all these people are just mucking up, they're, they're mucking up and, and raking up the ills of society. The idea here is, is that, again, much like Jacob Reese, these individuals are going to use their place in society as journalists to shine a light on the corruption uh, that was going on. So um, some of the major magazines that come out of this movement are Cosmopolitan, um, which is very different than the Cosmo we think of today, um, but it has its origins back all the way into the progressive movement. Um, one of the people is by the name of Lincoln Stephens. Um, he wrote Shame of the Cities, um, and it shone the light on business and c cities having corrupt alliances. So those political bosses like Boss Tweed, that was somebody he would target. None of these people are probably as famous as Ida Tarbell, and this is her pictured on the right here. Um, she wrote a book called The History of Standard Oil Company, and it really showed how, Nelson, how uh, John D. Rockefeller um, used ruthless means, used monopolies to his advantage, used price fixing and wage fixing to stifle competition, to, to stifle his workers, and to bust up unions and, tr and, and uh, those who would speak out against him. Her book is wildly successful, and it actually leads to a lot of changes because of this, because the government now can no longer turn a blind eye. The citizenry are reading this book, and they're calling for change and demanding change, just like uh, the rest of, the, of society had always been. But now it's the people who are wealthy who are calling for this. And so while you have people who are trying to clean up society itself with, um, you know, breaking up trust and shining a light on corruption, you also have people who are trying to clean up the social elements of society. Um, the things that they saw as uh, a corruption or awful. And so one of them is to stop prostitution. Um, prostitution is uh, jokingly known as the world's oldest profession. It's been around since even before biblical era. Um, many police begin to try to start to enforce laws um, through with the help of the local citizenry. Safety and sanitation and child labor laws all come into effect at this time. And this one in particular is prompted by what was known as the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911. Um, in this event, uh, there were women who were working, young women, in many of them in their 20s, working in a place called the Sh Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. This is a, shirtwaists are kind of the, the, the modern shirts of the day that many women would buy. Um, and most women worked in these companies making these garment goods. Um, somehow a fire starts in the building. We're not really exactly sure how. Maybe a cigarette was thrown into a, into a uh, lighter. But the way the building was constructed and the methods of which the business uh, owners uh, uh, controlled their employees caused a disaster. Um, the, the doors would only open inward. So when the fire struck and people were running to the door, they would crowd the door and not be able to open it up. The, the entryway um, allowed for only one person to pass through at a time so that they could be have their bags checked so to make sure they weren't stealing any garments. Um, there was not proper fire escapes. And the long story short, most of the women, there's many women who get stuck in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory um, and burn to death. And this really causes people to sit up and take notice because you're now seeing young girls who are dying um, on a large scale and needlessly but for a lot of these things. And so you begin to see things like lit exit signs at all times. You begin to see uh, uh, fire escapes being mandated by the government on every building. You begin to see regular breaks and fire hydrants and things like that that are, that are going on. And so you're beginning, what, what all this is really telling us is we're beginning to see the end of laissez-faire. And that's why this is such an important, this is why we learn about the progressive era. We're learning that, we're realizing now that the ideas of laissez-faire, this anything goes, that, you know, free market capitalism, while it's a great idea in theory, there has to be some government involvement to look out for the average worker. So unions shine a light on this of how their working conditions are happening. The, the muckrakers are shining a light on this of how there's corruption within government and business. And then Fires and disasters are shining a light on exactly what is happening in society that is making it such an awful place and that it needs to be cleaned up. And so we're going to continue to see all the way up through the 1940s kind of the end of the total laissez-faire attitude. We'll never completely move away from the idea of, of laissez-faire. Um, even to this day, we still think of ourselves as a free market capitalist society. And we really do want the free market, the people, to make most of the decisions. But there is this understanding that the government does sometimes have to get involved. One of those was when it came to the idea of temperance and prohibition. 
Prohibition happens in the 19 teens and third and 20s, and it's largely pushed by women early on. Um, it, the idea was that, that alcohol had kind of been blamed for a lot of the problems in society, um, battered women, lost wages, hurt families, unemployment. Many people thought that's exactly what's caused all of this. And so women in particular, but prohibitionists or teetotalers, are going to be the people who early on are pushing for prohibition. Eventually, they'll be in a constitutional amendment that will outlaw alcohol. That's going to have a lot of other consequences as a result, which we'll talk about in our next video. But for now, just understand that the idea of temperance, the idea of prohibition, goes along with this progressive era. They thought that they were cleaning up society, that they were literally bringing progress to America. Now, progressivism doesn't just stop with, with those in society who are wanting to push for things. It also trickles on to the uh, leaders of our country. And so um, one of those people is T uh, uh, sorry, Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he becomes president after William McKinley is assassinated. Um, and when he comes into office, he decides that he really wants to clean up society as well, like the muckrakers and the, and the progressives do. And so he is going to give America a square deal. And the idea is it's basically you're going to get a fair deal. You're going to be treated fairly in America if you do a good day's work and you work hard. And so one of the things he's going to do is he's going to control comp, uh, corporations. He's going to really stride to break up strikes um, at first, but then eventually he's going to start going after the companies themselves and, and will get the nickname of a trust buster. Um, he first targets the railroads, then eventually he'll start breaking up trusts like Standard Oil and some of the other the large companies that had previously been able to kind of do whatever they wanted to. He'll also come um, introduce something called the Consumer Protection uh, Bureau after reading uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, which we will talk about in class a little bit more. Um, once he reads that, it's so repulsive to him, he'll actually create what's known as the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act, which basically says that, that um, business owners can't change or alter f food or alter the labels in any way to be misleading. They have to be upfront and truthful about what's in their product. Roosevelt also was an avid hunter and an outdoorsman. He was very adventurous, and we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get more into his personal life himself. But what he initially does is he wants to actually um, conserve America's forest. He, he, being this outdoorsman and getting outside and, and being out there regularly, he had become to have this real affinity and appreciation for, um, for the American landscape. And so he's going to end up saving 125 million acres um, and creating the first national forest in the United States. Um, there is a legend that has gone around for years and um, that Teddy Roosevelt famously once was out hunting. He saw a mama bear and he went to go shoot this bear and behind her was a baby cub. And his heart was so touched by the baby bear and the mama bear being out together that he said, well, I cannot shoot that bear and leave that baby bear an orphan. And that story was reposted in, in newspapers around the country to the point that at some point um, a a a, a toy bear designer decided that they were going to name their toy bears the teddy bear after Teddy Roosevelt. And so that's where we get the nickname teddy bear for our, for your stuffed animal bears today. Um, the thing about Roosevelt that we always have to remember is that he set a lot of precedents, right? He really pushed for social reform pretty early on. Most presidents did not get into social matters. They left that to, to, to society. Um, he used what was known as the bully pulpit. That's what he would call it. He said, basically, I'm the president of the United States, and I have this ability to be able to speak and, and, and talk and have people listen to me, and so I can kind of use my stature to push things through society. Even if I can't maybe write a law to do it, maybe I can use my power and influence to help get things to happen. Roosevelt, though, is not our only progressive president. We also have one of our fattest presidents and one of our local Ohio presidents, um, William Howard Taft. Taft um, was a bigger trust buster than Roosevelt. He, busted, he broke up over 90 monopolies and trust. Um, however, he still angered Roosevelt. Roosevelt, at the end of his administration, when he runs for president and wins, he says famously, I will only run for one term of office. And he'll come to regret that. And at the end of his first term, he really did want to stay and re run for uh, re-election. But he stayed to his commitment and said, Taft is my natural successor. Taft should be the next president of the United States. Taft wins, um, but Taft angers Roosevelt. Roosevelt believes that Taft doesn't go far enough. And so in 1912, Roosevelt is going to reappear on the scene. Taft is going to run as a Republican, Woodrow Wilson is going to run as a Democrat, and Teddy Roosevelt is going to create a new party called the Bull Moose Party and run as a third party candidate. As you can imagine, Taft and Roosevelt split the vote and Woodrow Wilson becomes president. And that leads us up to World War I, which we talked about last year. And that's going to be important 
because now you're not going to have a, the same progressive ideas that, of of Roosevelt and Taft, but Wilson will make some progressive movement himself, but not as much uh, uh, on domestic policy. Taft or Roosevelt is much more of a foreign policy president, right? So last year we talked about kind of his ideas of the the League of Nations and of trying to secure peace around the world, and that's his big focus, not as much domestic policy, and so that's going to change over the years. So that's about it. Um, Will will talk much more about this in depth in class. If you have any questions, please come see me. Otherwise, this needs to be in your notes. Um, 2.4 will be posted here later this week, and you'll be able to get that 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 video anytime. Um, if you have any other questions, please come see me. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day, and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye bye, everybody.